If you purchased a dedicated astro camera to take better photos at night, then you might have run into a problem if you're using a Mac computer. That's because these dedicated astro cameras normally shoot in the FITS file format, which is basically just another form of raw data. The problem is that most applications don't know how to even open a FITS file, including Photoshop, Lightroom, Starry Sky Stacker, etc. So in this video, I want to show you how to stack your FITS files for free using ASI Studio. And this will work great whether you're on Mac, Windows, or anything else. To start off with, you want to head over to ZWO's website, go to the support tab, and then go to software. I'll have a link for this in the video description as well. Then if you're on Mac, you want to make sure you go to the right tab and download the ASI Studio, which just recently got an update. As I mentioned though, you can also do this if you're on Windows because ASI Studio is very easy to use and it's worth having. Then once you've downloaded ASI Studio, you can follow along with us today. Inside of the ASI Studio, there's a variety of different programs, including a deep sky imaging software, a FITS viewer, and the deep stack, which we'll be using in this video. So let's start off by opening up ASI deep stack right here. Next, I want you to click on the little gear icon in the upper right hand corner, and then turn on the scaling. That'll just make everything easier to see moving forward. After you've enabled the scaling, you can also change the save path, which by default should be in your documents folder. I'm not going to worry about that right now though, and then I'll hit OK. Let's close out of Deep Sky Stack though, so those settings can take effect, and then we'll reopen the application one more time. There we go. Now you should be able to see things better. The only problem with Deep Sky Stack is that it's very limited. You can stack your photos together, but you don't really have any control over what's going on. And that's why if you're on Windows, I normally use Deep Sky Stacker instead. This gives you way more control, but it also takes a lot longer and it's way more complicated. So if you're still a beginner, then this might be the perfect application for you, whether you're on Mac or Windows. The way it works is you're gonna choose your file type first, whether that's bias, dark, flats, or lights. I'll start off by selecting my light frames first, and then I'll choose select light. Next, I'll navigate to my folder, and because I took these photos with my ASI 533 monochrome camera, I've got two sets of data, H alpha and then oxygen. I need to stack both of these separately, otherwise the data will get all screwed up. So I'll start off by selecting my first H alpha photo, hold down the shift key, click on the last H alpha photo, and then click on open. It's telling me it cannot identify the Bayer array pattern, but this was captured with a monochrome camera, so that's what I'll choose and then hit OK. And there's a quick look at the Veil Nebula, which I photographed. To be honest, this is one of my favorite features of the ZWO products, is that they always do this auto stretch really well, and you can actually see what's going on. That just makes everything easier from the image capture to the image review, and here in stacking as well. Anyway, after you've loaded in your light frames, you might also want to grab a set of darks, flats, and bias. However, the ASI 533 has a really good sensor and there's no amp glow. So because of that, I really don't need to worry about dark frames or bias frames. And because I'm using the SpaceCat or RedCat telescope, I don't really have any vignette either. So there's really no need for flat frames. This is one reason I really love my setup because it's lightweight, it's portable, and I normally don't have to worry about my calibration frames even though traditionally you're always told to take them, which is probably good advice, but I like to make my life easier and not have to worry about it. So today I'm just gonna be stacking the light frames. Assuming you've loaded in your lights, darks, flats, whatever you need, then all you have to do is click the play button right here. It'll go through, stack everything automatically in just a few seconds. You don't have to worry about doing your star detection thing and all that other stuff that you might in some of the other stacking applications. And there we go. This is a look at our stacked H alpha data. It's still pretty grainy though. That's just because I only captured about 50 minutes worth of data. And I would normally like to have a couple hours worth of data per filter. But living here in the Pacific Northwest, you gotta make do with what you got. The photo hasn't actually been saved yet though. And to do that, we'll hover over this toolbar here and then click on the floppy disk icon at the bottom. This will save the image and it doesn't even give you a pop-up, which is kind of weird, but you'll need to click on the little open folder icon right here. That should bring you to the save directory, and in this case, that's in my documents folder. What it's gonna do is actually give you three photos to work with, a fit file, a JPEG, and a TIFF. For today's workflow, we're actually just gonna use the JPEG, because as you can see here, it's already been pre-stretched, and it looks pretty good. 
I'm not going to worry about the TIFF because I've covered that in some of the other tutorials, including over on my Patreon page, where we're going to go through and stretch the data so it actually looks like this, and then we go through and process it. But today I want to keep things simple. Before we go any further, we should probably rename these photos so we don't get confused. This was all H-alpha data. So what I'm going to do is rename these photos to H-alpha stack, H-alpha stack, and then H-alpha stack. Okay, now that we've renamed our photos, we can minimize that window. And we're going to do this again with our oxygen data because I took two sets of images. For that, I'll select all of my photos here by holding down the shift key and then removing them. Then we'll click on select light again. This time we'll grab our oxygen photos. And apparently I only have 10 of these, which is even worse. So not a lot of data to work with, unfortunately. It's giving us the same error as before, but these are captured with a monochrome camera. You should already have your darks, flats, and bias included, so that's good to go. And we'll just click on the play button again. As I said, this is one of the fastest, easiest ways to stack your images together. There we go. There's the stacked oxygen data. And we'll do the same thing. We'll click over on the floppy disk icon. Then we'll click on the open folder button right here. And we'll rename these photos as well as oxygen stack. Okay, now that we have our H alpha and oxygen, we're ready to move on into Photoshop. But that's the basics anyway of using the ASI Studio to stack your FITS files if you're on a Mac computer. Because as we talked about, if you're on Mac, it really makes things much more difficult for astrophotography. You simply don't have access to the same programs that we do over on Windows. And for that reason, I normally recommend anybody on Mac consider buying at least a cheap Windows laptop so you can do some of this basic processing to make your life easier. Now that we've done our stacking though, we can close out of ASI Studio and we'll do a quick processing tutorial inside of Photoshop. From here, we can either open up the TIFF files or the JPEGs. Normally, I would say open up the TIFF files, but that's something I'll save for my Deep Space course or even over on Patreon. We just did a similar tutorial earlier this month. And the benefit of working with the TIFF files is that it should give you a higher quality image at the end of the workflow. Today though, I want to keep things simple and fast, so we're just going to use the JPEG photos, and as you'll see, you'll still get a great photo. So I'm going to select both of my images, and then open these inside of Photoshop. And this will be the same workflow if you're on Mac or Windows. Once you've gotten your various filtered images opened up inside of Photoshop, you can choose any one as the base layer. Today I'll go with Oxygen as our base. And because these are JPEGs, we can go up to Image, Mode, and we see it's already set to RGB color, 8 bits per channel. We are going to be running these images through Starnet later, so we might as well change it to RGB and 16 bits per channel before we go any further. Okay, now that this is a 16 bit RGB photo, we'll click on the Channels tab, and we see we have a channel for red, green, and blue, but it's all the same data. Since I'm using a monochrome camera, I need to grab my H alpha data right here. I'll hit Control or Command A to select everything, Control or Command C to copy that data. Again, this is the H alpha data. Then I go back to the oxygen tab, go to the channels tab, and because the H alpha data normally corresponds to the red color channel, we'll paste that data in with Control or Command V, again on the red color channel. Now, when we turn on the eyeball for RGB, we have a color image, but there's a problem. The stars are not lined up. And before we go any further, hit Control or Command D to deselect. This is one of the problems with using ASI Studio for your stacking, is because it is so limited, there's no way to choose a reference frame. And that just means more work for you here in post-processing. What we're gonna do though, is click on our red color channel, zoom way into the photo, grab the Move tool, and then click and drag the red layer around until the stars all line up. You can also use the arrow keys on your keyboard to move it around even more precisely. You can see I can move them to the left, to the right. But I want to line them up as close as I can. That way we have a full color image with no artifacts. That's actually pretty easy to do. Then we can zoom out. And there's our new color photo in just a few seconds. This is another reason why I love using my dedicated astro camera because now I can capture a couple of hours of oxygen, a couple of hours of H alpha, and still get a color photo. And this image you're looking at was captured in a fairly light polluted area, 
during a nearly full moon, but I was still able to get some amazing detail. That just goes to show you how impressive these dedicated astro cameras can be when they're paired with the right filters. Okay, if you've got your stars lined up, we'll click on RGB so everything's highlighted. Then we'll go back to the Layers tab right here. At this point, we're going to start with our basic editing workflow. Again, I cover this in detail in my Deep Space course over on how to. There's over 90 videos there that will teach you everything you need to know. And I really go through it for every skill level. We start off slow for beginners, and then we really ramp it up for the more advanced shooters. One of the things you'll learn there, though, is that if you add a curves layer right here, you have the option to add a black point dropper, which is going to be the top one of the three. Once you've clicked on your black point dropper, change the blending mode here from normal to color. This makes it so whatever changes we do are only going to affect the colors in the photo, not the brightness, which is important. Anyway, with our curves layer set to the color blending mode and our black dropper selected, all we need to do is click somewhere in the photo that should be black, maybe right here. And in one click, we've pretty much neutralized that overly blue color cast, and that looks a lot better. If you click though and it looks really messed up, just keep clicking around the photo until it looks good to you. And I think right there will work for today. We fixed the color cast with one click. Now let's add a bit of contrast with another curves layer. And this time with the curves layer, we'll click on the hand tool. With the hand tool selected, we can zoom in. And if we want to make an area brighter, we'll click and drag our mouse upwards. Find a nearby area to click and drag our mouse downwards to make it darker. And we just add a lot of nice contrast right there. Now here's our B4 and after. It might be a bit strong and the stars are getting a bit bright, but that's pretty good for right now. I can always lower the opacity though of this layer so it's not as intense, maybe 60 or 70 percent. And that already looks a lot better than where we started. At this point in the workflow, I would normally run this image through Starnet, which is a free download for both Windows and Mac. The new version of Starnet can be a little bit difficult to find, so I'll have this page linked in the video description as well. And thankfully there's a new graphical user interface for Windows users, and I believe there was also a graphical user interface for Mac as well, although I think you had to do a little bit of work to make that happen. Anyway, I'd recommend you spend some time learning about Starnet if you haven't used it yet, because the new version 2 works a lot better than the old Starnet++. Today though, because I am on Windows, I'm going to demonstrate with the graphical user interface, which really streamlines the whole process. Fastest way to access this is to search for Starnet and then open the file location. Here's our new Starnet GUI. Again, you should be able to get this to work on Mac as well, so you'll want to do some research on that. The way the graphical user interface works, though, is you've got two different fields, input and output. Before we get to this, though, we should probably go back to Photoshop and make sure this image is ready to go. So what I'm going to do is hit Command, Shift, Option, E, or if you're on Windows, Control, Shift, Alt, E. Again, that's Command, Shift, Option, E, or Control, Shift, Alt, E. If you do that correctly, it'll create a new composite layer, which will be the foundation for the rest of our workflow. Then we'll go up to File, Save As. Make sure you do Save As, not Save. And we'll call this whatever you want to, maybe Veil Stack or Starnet, and then we'll click on Save. I noticed I missed a step back there though, so I'm actually going to cancel this real fast and do that again because you want to make sure when you're saving this, you always include the color profile sRGB. Anyway, once you've done that, and we've renamed this to Starnet or something, click Save. You can use whatever image compression you want. We'll hit OK. And there we go. There's our new foundation for the rest of our workflow. If you want to give Starnet a try, let's close out of this and this one too. We'll head back to Starnet, and then we'll click on Browse. We have our starnet.tiff located right here. I'll click on that. And you have to be careful because the output line down here is going to be exactly the same, but you need to rename it. We'll call this starnet after.tiff and then click on run. And as long as you did everything correctly, it should run through no problem. There it goes. If you run into a problem here, it's probably because your image was not saved as a 16-bit TIFF file, which is something I showed you earlier in the video. 
So if you need to check it, open up your starnet.tiff again, go up to image, mode, and if it says eight bits per channel, put it to 16, save the TIFF, and then try the application again. Anyway, when Starnet completes, we'll pick back up and continue on with the workflow. That didn't take too long at all. Starnet is finished. We can now close out of the command prompt window and then navigate to our directory and open up the new Starnet after .tiff. The reason I love using Starnet is because it removes all those distracting stars that are otherwise kind of obscuring your view of the nebula. I realize that the effect is pretty extreme and some of you might not like that, which is fine. You don't have to use Starnet if you don't want to. And one thing I show you in the Deep Space course is we're gonna take the image with all the stars in it, we're gonna reduce them, and we're gonna incorporate them into this photo as well so we get the best of both worlds. But I'll save that for another video. From here, the big thing that I have a problem with is the splotchy area right here. And that's why I normally just grab my stars image right here with controller command A, controller command C to copy it, and I paste it in as a new layer on top. Then I hold down my alt or option key, click the add layer mask button, which adds a black layer mask and that essentially turns off the stars. Next, I grab a white paintbrush, I zoom into the problem area, and with my white paintbrush on my black layer mask, I just paint in the star. I don't want to go too far though, because I'm going to bring in all the other stars, so you got to be careful. But just paint in that big bright star there so it looks a bit more normal. And there we go. If I think that looks good, I'll hit Command Shift Option E again, or Control Shift Alt E to create that new composite layer. And then finally, we're going to run this through Topaz Labs Topaz Denoise. I remember hearing a lot about this application over the years, and I never wanted to spend the money on it, so I said, you know what, this year I'm finally gonna give it a try. And I gotta say, it worked better than I would have expected. The way this works is you have a few different AI algorithms you can use, standard, clear, low light, etc. And then from there, you can further refine the algorithm with these various sliders. And I found that if you can really hone in on the sliders, you not only remove all the grain, but you increase the detail that's there originally. We might best see this right around here. Look at the original, it's very grainy, and the filaments here in the nebula are kind of soft, but with the help of the topaz noise, it cleans up the image and it reveals the structure of those filaments. And again, one of the best ways to get better quality images is just to capture more data, but this was only about not even two hours worth of data. So if I had 10 or 15 hours, it'd probably look like this to begin with, but this is the best I can do living here in the Pacific Northwest. So yeah, I just wanted to show you that uh, Topaz Denoise actually does work pretty well nowadays, and you can always tweak these sliders to make it look good for your own image. If you're happy with that, we'll hit apply, and then it's gonna go through and add that to our photo. When the filter is completed, I recommend you turn off the eyeball for layer two, and just do a before and after. Make sure it didn't add any artifacts. You might also wanna zoom into the photo at various places and do another before and after and see how it looks. See how right here before is very kind of soft and pixelated, but after it looks pretty impressive actually. So yeah, that's one way to do it. And now that we've got our filters applied here, we'll rename layer two to Topaz Denoise so we know what it did. And I always like to go back and look at the original photo just to get some idea of what's going on because right here it looks awfully soft compared to everything else. It almost looks smudged. That could be because of Starnet, or it could just be, you know, the data itself wasn't all that great to begin with. As I'm doing this before and after, there's definitely a reason to keep all your stars. It still looks nice, but for me, I love being able to see the more fine details that are normally obscured. We've already gone on pretty long today, so I'm gonna wrap up this tutorial. The final thing we'll do is click on the crop tool rotate the image around to more normal view, and then we'll crop in the bottom and corner there so we don't have any weird problems, and that'll work for today. Last but not least, I'll add another curves layer. Click on my hand tool and bring down that sky so it's nice and dark, and then bring up the nebula so we can actually see it a bit better. And you can always spend more time there tweaking the curve layer so the contrast isn't as extreme. 
Finally, one of the things I show in my Deep Space course is the selective color layers. These allow you to really target the colors and bring them out or subdue them however you want to. And this is one of my favorite ways to get better quality images is with the selective color. Yeah, that's going to do it for today's video. I'll go back up to File, Save. All right, well, I hope this video helped you out if you're on a Mac computer because those FITS files really aren't that easy to work with. And that's why we used ASI Studio to stack everything together. And then we brought the JPEGs or the TIFFs into Photoshop for the last of our processing. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video. Hey, folks, it's your boy, Badlands Chugs. And if you have one of these, and you want to learn how to take awesome night sky photos, all you got to do is holler at Peter Zalenka. He's the man that will take your photography to the next level, past the stratosphere, past low Earth orbit. If you're into shooting the sun, moon, stars, quasars, other heavenly bodies, deep space, and the Milky Way, all you have to do is go to howtube.com slash channels slash Peter Zelenka. Take your photos out of this world, out of this galaxy. Peter Zelenka will teach you. So as we chug this Milky Way milkshake in the dead of night, you go to howtube.com slash channels slash Peter Zelenka. It's out of this world. He can teach you. Cheers.